In today's video, we're going to talk about the left atrium. And what I've done is draw three different diagrams that give different views of the left atrium so that we can see it in its entirety. Now, the left atrium, as you might remember, is the chamber of the heart that drains blood from the pulmonary system. So four pulmonary veins come in and drain into the left atrium. It's also located at the most posterior portion of the heart. So it's the most posterior chamber. Now, if we look at the left atrium, we want to remember that the left atrium is connected to the right atrium by a double-walled septum. And this septum is usually called the septal wall. However, the rest of the atrium that is not attached to that septal wall is called the free wall. And the free wall is the part that receives pulmonary venous blood from four sources. The left superior pulmonary vein, the left inferior pulmonary vein, the right superior pulmonary vein, and the right inferior pulmonary vein. And these four veins drain blood into the chamber. From there, the left atrium sends blood across the bicuspid, or you might hear it called the mitral valve, to the left ventricle. Now, a fun little bit of trivia is that the word mitral valve got its name from the Latin word mitre, which refers to the shape of a bishop's hat. And I've drawn a picture of that hat right here for your reference. And you can see that if you look at the mitral valve, which is this structure labeled number five right here, the two, um, the, where the chordae tendinae attached to the papillary muscles in the left ventricle, those two are like kind of the tops of the mitre of the bishop's hat. However, you'll probably hear me call it the bicuspid valve most of the time, which means two cusps, which in this case would be the anterior and posterior cusps. Now, I haven't drawn those in here. We'll focus on that in a future video. Now, if we look at this diagram to orient ourselves, we see that the aorta is coming up. We've got the left and right pulmonary arteries. Behind that, we see the superior and inferior vena cava. Here's the left ventricle. And what we've done is we've just taken a bite out of the left atrium. We've removed a section of it so that we can see inside of the left atrium. Now, we said that there are four pulmonary veins that drain into the heart of this chamber. However, only two of them are seen in this diagram. The other two, when we dissected out a portion so that we could look inside, those contain, that section of heart that we dissected out contained the other two pulmonary veins, which we'll discuss in a moment. However, for now, we can see the right superior pulmonary vein and the right inferior pulmonary vein. I also want to draw your attention to this left atrial appendage, which we'll talk about in much greater detail later. But for now, I want you to notice that it's got pectinate muscles inside of it, which are those ridged muscles, whereas the interior portion of the chamber really is mostly a smooth surface as compared to the right atrium, which had pectinated muscles in the majority of the chamber. The left atrium, by contrast, is mostly smooth. Now, you'll remember that in the previous video, we talked about the foramen ovale. And we talked about how in the right atrium, you see a hole, the, the septum is a double-walled septum that runs between the left and the right atrium. And on the right side of the atrium, we call that wall the septum secundum. And on the left side of the atrium, we call that side of the wall the septum primum. Both of these walls have a hole that allow the passage of blood to flow through. On the right side, we call that hole the foramen ovale. However, on the left side, we call it something different. We actually call it the ostium secundum or the foramen secundum. And so even though the wall is the septum primum, the hole in that wall is the foramen secundum. Now, another structure to point out is the flap of the foramen ovale. Now, this is a little flap of tissue made up of septum primum tissue that is identifiable within the left atrial wall. You will not see the foramen ovale, but you will see a little flap of it, and it's just this little ridge of tissue right here. Now, a propatent foramen ovale should not be considered an ASD, an atrial septal defect. And that's because what can happen is you could actually sometimes stick a probe 
in between the two septal walls and actually have a patent area. However, because pressures in the left atrium are so much higher than pressures in the right atrium, this valve is considered to be functionally closed. I like to think of it like a door. Let's pretend that the foramen ovale is a door. And what's supposed to happen in fetal development is that that door is supposed to be sealed shut so that nothing can get through it. However, sometimes instead of being sealed shut, instead of the septum primum and the second septum secundum fusing together, they don't fuse together, but because the door is closed, imagine someone putting pressure on that door and keeping it closed, that's what's happening. The left atrium is putting pressure on this wall, keeping it closed so that no blood flow is exchanged between the left and the right atrium. And so that's how I like to think of it. So in this case, it would not be considered an atrial septal defect. Now, we talked about the free wall. We want to note that it has a dome-shaped body. And it's separated from the left atrial appendage by two structures. Now, what I've done in this diagram is I've simply drawn the left atrium, which is outlined here in black, and just a small portion of the left ventricle so that we can see some of the veins that separate the two from each other. And again, you'll see the aorta and the pulmonary veins, or the pulmonary arteries. So as we look at this, we can now see all four of the pulmonary veins, which I have drawn in red. And these veins, looking from the outside of the heart, are just simply draining into that left chamber. Now, the first one we said was the left superior. Here we have the left inferior, the right superior, and the right inferior pulmonary veins. And you'll notice that the right side is much closer to the inferior vena cava, whereas the left side is further away. Now, a couple of the veins that we want to talk about, and we're not going to go into great depth on all the different cardiac veins, but a couple that are particularly relevant to the left side of the atrium are the vein of Marshall. This is also called the oblique vein of the left atrium. And what it does, it's this blue structure right here, and it drains blood from the left atrium intracardiac muscle to the coronary sinus. And what I mean by that is that the heart itself has to have a blood supply. And so it's not draining blood from inside of the left atrium, but rather from the tissue that makes up the left atrium itself. And so this vein, the vein of Marshall, or the oblique vein of the left atrium, drains into the coronary sinus. We also have the vein of Marshall merges with the great cardiac vein, which the great cardiac vein and the posterior vein of the left ventricle to form the coronary sinus. Now the great cardiac vein is this blue vein right here. So we said this was the vein of Marshall. Here we have the great cardiac vein and the posterior vein of the left ventricle is this third vessel right here. And these three vessels merge together to form the coronary sinus, which is this large structure right here. And the valve at the junction of these three veins is called the Vucin's valve. Now, what we want to know about this is that sometimes some of these vessels have a different anatomy in different patients. For example, sometimes this posterior vein of the left ventricle will actually drain into the cardiac vein rather than draining directly into the coronary sinus. And so we have these slight normal anatomic variations that are seen in different populations. This is just one example of how you might see it. Now, the circumflex artery supplies blood to most of the left atrium, and that's this red vessel right here. This is the vessel that actually provides oxygenated blood to the left atrium. Continuing on, we see that the left atrium is mostly a smooth surface. Now, what I've done in this third diagram is imagine that we took this first diagram and we just shifted our view a little bit to the right so that we could see the rest of the pulmonary veins. And that's what I've done. If we just shifted to the right, we would see once again that we have the right superior and inferior pulmonary veins. We can no longer visualize 
where the, fr where the flap of the foramen ovale used to be. That's out of view here. But we can now see the left superior pulmonary vein and the left inferior pulmonary vein. I want you to notice the auricle here. The pectinate muscles are confined to the left atrial appendage. You won't see pectinate muscles in the rest of the chamber. This is all going to be smooth, but the auricle will be heavily pectinated. On the endocardium, we also have a left lateral ridge, which corresponds to the ligament of Marshall on the exterior. Now, coming back to this original diagram, the ligament of Marshall actually runs right next to the vein of Marshall, or that oblique vein of the left atrium. It's just a little fold of tissue that persists, and it's the remnant of an embryological structure. However, on the inner aspect of the heart, the parallel to the ligament of Marshall, which is found on the outside, is this left lateral ridge. And what it does is it separates the ostium of the auricle, or basically the orifice that opens into the left, um, the left atrium, from the pulmonary veins. The left atrial appendage is frequently the site of thrombus formation. This is because it has many pectinate muscles and it's a very narrow, kind of confined area. It also has a wind sock shaped formation with little crenellations in it. And what that means is it's really just like a long tubular structure with these little crenellations or divots within it. Also, I want to point out that coming back to this diagram, these little um, circles here represent little pits that are found around this left lateral ridge. They're just little pits that surround it. Also, and I think this is the most interesting part of the left atrial appendage, it contains 30% of the heart supply of atrial natriuretic peptide. And what this hormone does is help to regulate blood volume. When it's secreted, it signals the kidneys to increase the release of sodium, which thereby increases the amount of water that's excreted in the urine. And so at 30%, it has a, a function in hormone control as well as just pumping blood through the body. Every once in a while in surgery, you'll find that some patients who have atrial fibrillation, which is just a condition where blood um, pools inside of the chambers of the atria, sometimes they'll actually seal off this left atrial appendage because it is such a prominent site for that thrombus formation. And that makes up the structures that you'll find in the left